Thank you so much for allowing me to be here, and thank you for inviting me. This is quite the interesting uh, program that I am proud and happy to be a part of. I am the chief executive of Ancestry Solutions, a company I founded in 1990. I've been a professional genealogist since 1990, but I actually entered the field of genealogy in 1983. So I was right at the beginning of when the Latter-day Saints Church sort of opened up their doors to non-members to participate in their great family history libraries and family history centers. So, with that short introduction, <laughs> we will go to the business of where genetics meets genealogy. We're going to go over a few of the background high points first, just so everybody has a clear understanding of the basics. Anatomy of a cell. At the top, we have one cell. In the center is the nucleus, which contains the 23 chromosomes. These little white spots around the outside are filled with the mitochondria. And if you've had a mitochondria DNA test done, you know that relates strictly to inheritance along the female line. Mother to mother to mother to mother. So it never follows a static surname. The surname changes with each generation back. The cells, the chromosomes in the lower diagram show all 23 of the chromosomes. You'll notice chromosome 2 is rather longer than the rest. This chromosome here is the longest chromosome in the human genome and contains 242 million base pairs. Now it's base pairs that your DNA tests are comparing with the base pairs of another tester. When you stop to consider that overall in one human genome, each individual has three billion base pairs that they're dealing with. Yeah, <laughs> quite a number, isn't it? Yet, the DNA tests that we have today at the most are able to do 800,000 800, SNPs which contain far less than the three billion base pairs we're talking about. So when you think of just those numbers alone, you immediately have a disconnect between is it really possible to identify someone strictly on a DNA test? And really when you think about the numbers you're dealing with, the answer is no, not at all. It's possible in certain circumstances and it's possible if you have a match with someone that has a long series of shared centimorgans. A hundred shared centimorgans, if they have a solid family tree to go with that, you can probably find the match fairly easily. But as that shared centimorgan number decreases, the chances of finding a good match without a good tree, and we're talking a genealogical tree, diminishes exponentially. So, with that, one also has to say, well, okay, what about those ethnicity results we keep getting? And I uh, have to say that because of the method by which each testing company programs their computer with the algorithms to determine ethnicity is based solely on the people who are in their testing pool. Myself, I tested 95% British <laughs> and 5% German. Before FTDNA changed their algorithm, we were 92% British, 5% German, and the remainder Ashkenazi Jewish. When they changed their algorithm, they took away the Ashkenazi Jewish <laughs> and made it 5% German. Now, in my genealogical history, my German ancestor came from Hamburg in the 1790s to 1820s time period, a time period when the Jewish population was high, a place where the Jewish population was high, 
there were no real limits on whether a German married a Jewish woman or vice versa. So in all likelihood, if we could find the records, I still may find that I have Ashkenazi Jewish background. Now what happens when FTDNA decides they're going to change their algorithm again? Right? <laughs> I could lose my 95% British and they could tell me I'm 90% Scandinavian. Which really, when you stop to think about it, what is British? <laughs> right? The British population, when you start with the Celts, because prehistory becomes too difficult. If you start with the Celts, they were then invaded by the Romans. They were then invaded by the Vikings, by the Danes, by the Anglo-Saxons, and eventually by the Normans. And each invasion saw the invading population assimilating into the native population. So really, what is British? And I suspect the same problem with ethnicity results is across the board. Because when you're talking about somebody who, uh, well, for instance, my matches have an awful lot of Scandinavian matches. And yet there is no genealogical record that will identify a Scandinavian match I have with the British tree I have. Yet the matches are there, the matches are solid, they're proven, they're not noise. They're, they're genuine matches. I'll probably never find them. And it's probably related to one of these past <laughs> invasions of Britain. So on that note, we shall proceed. This, I'm sure everybody has seen the double helix of a DNA strand at the top. That is actually two strands of DNA joined together with the base pairs in the middle. Now, A always binds with T, and C always binds with G, and that will become important in a few minutes. The lower half of the diagram, and is, this is very hard to see. I'm sorry about that. But you'll see we have, this is tester one up here, and this is tester two down here. <coughs> Now, chromosome 21 has been the model for this particular diagram. Here are the two strands of DNA that exist in the tester, in the, the, the uh, testee. And these two strands are the match. But what the companies do, they don't take both strands and compare them to both strands. They only take one half and compare it to one half. And this is why we can never be sure when we have a match, whether it's on one side of the family or the other, without other documentary sources backing up where that match occurs. Now, if you can see, here we have TT, and here we have TT. So the two are a match. That then becomes known as a full inherited uh, reference. The next spot that is examined, now remember, they don't examine every single base pair along these strands of DNA. They only take certain little groupings. So you may be missing other matches or non-matches in between. The next match is GG to CT. So in this region, there is no identical region of match. And it's usually indicated on a chromosome browser by a red stripe. And you'll see one of those, too. The AG, GA, you would think that's not a match, but it is. It's still the same two proteins that are bonded in the same place, only the one in the, the test subject is reversed. It is still considered a fully identical region of DNA even though the testers has reversed from the original testee. And then the last one, we have CC compared to CA. And this is a half identical region of matching. So again, you will see these red, green, and yellow colors on your chromosome browser. I don't know how many people have tested with FTDNA or have uploaded to GEDmatch. 
and are familiar with looking at a chromosome browser but don't really know what it means. <laughs> these are the colors and these are what is going on. That is what is going on in the test results. Which brings us to proof. Proof, of course, is something that we all strive for. And proof can only exist and be as reliable as the three elements that go into it. Now, this applies not only to documentary proof, but it also applies to DNA proof. First, you have a source document, and you have to consider, is it a raw original document, which is the best kind? Is it a derivative work? Or is it a narrative work? With DNA testing, we have a raw original document, which is the actual DNA itself. Moving on to the second element of proof, which is the classification of the information, do we have a primary or first-hand uh, piece of evidence looking at us? Well, we do. It's our DNA. Just as with a document, if you have a birth certificate and it's not a copy or a transcript, then you have a primary or first-hand original document. The secondary or second-hand document becomes a little less reliable because there could have been mistakes made in the transcription from the, the original. And this is where the DNA reports come in. They are actually a secondary piece of evidence. They are not primary because somebody somewhere in an office has taken your DNA test results and devised a report based on their knowledge. Now, their knowledge may be missing in some places. It may be exceptionally good, but we don't know that. As the recipient of that report, we don't have that information. So at best, the DNA reports are only secondary information. The nature of the evidence, is it direct or is it indirect? Well, again, the DNA test is a direct piece of evidence, but it can also be an indirect piece of evidence. When you have a test result that you're comparing to someone else's test result and that other person doesn't have a fully developed tree available, you would look at their DNA match with yours and say, hmm, okay, it says we match on a certain chromosome for a certain amount of shared segments, but they don't have a tree, so I can't determine where that match is so now I have a piece of indirect evidence in the DNA match that kind of leads me in the direction to say, well, there's a relationship there somewhere. I just don't know where. So has DNA testing really satisfied all three elements? Yes, to some degree. But how reliable is that proof? That is the question. That is the really big question. OK. What relationship, you say? This is the part I like. <laughs> I'm terrible. I will spend hours and hours and hours and hours digesting my matches to see where they actually line up. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't because of the fact they don't have developed trees. Now, on the far side, this is a scale. And uh, are you doing these as handouts as well, Julia? Uh, no. No. Okay. no, but they will be recorded in perpetuity. <laughs> Great. <laughs> because this scale tells you approximately where, if you have a match with somebody at the 90 to 200 <coughs> centimorgan length, those people will be second cousins once removed, half second cousins, first cousins three times removed, but notice that that 200 overlaps with the 200 starting point in the next row up, which can include second cousins, first cousins twice removed, or half first cousins once removed. And as you go down, it becomes even more of a gray area. Now, a lot of people are aiming for the top levels. 
where you can say, okay, somebody's come to you with a match of 1,300 <coughs> They must be a half-sibling or a grandparent. Maybe, maybe not. Because 1,300 centimorgans is also the top level for a first cousin or a great grandparent. And this is why you cannot rely solely on your DNA match results. There are crossovers between each degree of relationship. And the only way you can determine what degree of relationship that is, is with the genealogical tree by saying, okay, I can trace your descent from X ancestor and my descent from X ancestor, therefore we are half siblings, niece, nephew, whatever. But until that is documented genealogically, you can't take a DNA result and immediately say, this is my grandfather. <coughs> Doesn't work that way. Now, some examples. This is my test result from FTDNA with three people. And I picked these three people specifically because PM up here does not have a tree online. That third icon is not lit up. She does not have a tree online, yet the estimated relationship is third to fifth cousin. Because of her 61 total shared center organs, with the longest shared segment being 15. Well, when we look back over here again, of course, this is off the, the scale. So we're down into fourth, fifth, sixth cousins. Now the second fellow, Mr. DW, third to fifth cousin, he has 60 centimeters, the centimorgans shared with me, the longest being 13 segments. LS, second to fourth cousin. And this is astonishing because her shared centimorgans total are the same as Mr. DW. Her longest shared segment is 23, which you would think she must be a closer match. But documentarily, no, she isn't. It says fourth cousin second twice removed is the estimated relationship. She is actually, oh, that is the fourth cousin second removed. But they had predicted that she would be in 4.7% uh, degree of kinship, and she's actually eighth generation kinship. Same with Mr. DW up here. Now, they both have very good trees online. The thing I have with Mr. DW is a long history of correspondence. I started corresponding with him in 1993 regarding a possible shared ancestor. <clears throat> we didn't have the proof in the documents. I had a suspicion. It involved an illegitimate daughter of my third time great grandparents who married subsequently. So they were both the parents of this daughter. <laughs> But at the time, we had no documentation to say, yes, she was the daughter, because of course her name magically changed after the parents got married. She had been born as a Broadbridge, and after the parents married, became a Rook. So I had been corresponding with Mr. DW since 1993, and we had been going back and forth about this problem. I said, look, I really suspect this is her. I really do, because she's disappeared. And she turns up 10 miles away. Got to be the same woman. There is no other woman by this name in this region. So we had to let it lay. Now, LS, I have never talked to. However, I want to go to the chromosome browser for Mr. DW. This is what his match looks like compared to me. Now remember, this doesn't compare him to anybody else, just him to me. He matches on the 9th and he matches on the 11th. Again, the estimated was 4.5. He ends up at six generations of him, not 4.5. Why? Because we have multiple lines of descent. 
So those multiple lines of descent have translated into DNA results that appear by computer algorithm to predict a relationship closer than it actually is. Now, LS, this is her result. Again, she's predicted at 4.7, but she comes in at eight generations out, again for the same problem. Now, this is DNA Painter. If you're not using DNA Painter, you want to get to know it. It will help tremendously. And I've got them labeled. This is Mr. DW's segments on the ninth chromosome. And this is his segment on the 11th chromosome. <clears throat> Look at LS's segments on the 9th chromosome. They're all broken up and they're all tiny weeny ones. So I couldn't make a comparison based on the 9th chromosome. But look at her segment on the 11th chromosome. This is the big one that they were showing in the results. It lines up perfectly with the start position of Mr. DW. Now, LS happens to have a really good tree online and readily available. So I was able, once I saw that result, I went, okay, they are definitely hovering on the same ancestral line. I went into her tree, dissected it. I had to advance it a little further to bring it down to the present date to put me in place. And sure enough, we're also cousins in the fourth degree. So... And DNA Painter will help tremendously. Now, all of these up here, they all sort of start on the same. I don't know where they belong. Why don't I know where they belong? Because the people don't have trees online. And they haven't been discoverable through Google searches or searches on their emails or any other extrapolation I have tried to use to find them. They, I can't find them anywhere. So they'll just sit in the unknown portion on that chromosome for a while. <laughs> now, this screen and this screen are interrelated and they prove why genealogy is important. These four documents relate to three marriages of one man. The first one was in 1836 in India. He was a member, he was an officer in the British India Regiment. 1836, he married for the first time. They're all original documents to some degree. No father mentioned in 36. 1851, the father is mentioned. And again, this is very hard to see. The writing is really atrocious, but the father's name is Edward. I took a lot of time, did a lot of magnification work, compared it with other letters on the page. It definitely says Edward. The image on the far left is a transcript of that 1851 marriage. The transcriber recorded the father's name as Edmund because that's what she or he saw and that's what they put down. <laughs> This last image is an 1856 marriage for the same fellow. Father is very clearly recorded as Edward. So I had a DNA match write to me and say, I'm an adoptee, can you help me? We match, but we match in such small proportion that it's gonna be a lifetime trying to find out where she fits into my tree. I feel sorry <laughs> that I can't do it immediately, but she jumped on this because she does have a connection to this George Carmen who was in the British India Army. That's proven documentarily. She had another researcher who wrote to her and said, oh yes, his father is Edmund and they're from Kent, England. And she came back to me with this and she said, but you know, I'm looking at other ancestry trees and other people have adopted that Edmund and taken him to the USA. So I rolled my eyes and said, okay, maybe this time he really did go to the USA. So I did a bit of background research on Edmund's family in the USA, and sure enough, they were there. And sure enough, his son George was there, married eight miles away from the town they had settled in. His sister Anna had married another 12 miles away from the town they'd settled in. 
So that George Kerman was definitely in the USA. I went back to my DNA match and I told her the, the results. And I said, okay, so has anybody looked at the original documents for this marriage? Oh no, we don't know where to find them. We just got this from an index off of family search. Okay, so I did a bit of background digging and I discovered that I could access the original documents through the portal at the Family History Center. I went, I retrieved the documents, I immediately saw the father's name is Edward. So that completely destroys their tree. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why genealogy still is going to be so important when trying to compare it and assimilate it with your DNA results. Okay. <laughs> so, are we taking questions now or later? Yeah, we're taking, thank you, Susan. That was a lot of science compressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that was fantastic. So useful. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Um, we, uh, yeah, we have a, we'll take a couple of quick questions and then we'll move on. We've got one from, from uh, the feed. Yeah. Uh, so one of our viewers would like to know, is it because of the limits of the DNA testing that a man would show as a first cousin matched to his paternal aunt? Is it also possible that he would show as a first cousin to a half-sister? Yes. It's, if we go back to uh, slide number, okay. Let's go. <laughs> this, this slide here. This uh, tree of shared centimorgans is the reason why people are finding these results because they're not taking into account that the amount of shared centimorgans may in fact belong to another category than the category they're looking at. Okay, and it's only going to be through hard, dedicated genealogical research that he's going to find the answer to his question. It only works for DNA for adoptees, where they have a definitive match at the 3300 Santa Morgan level. Then they would know for sure they had found a parent. Okay? <laughs> Any other quick questions from the room? Yes. Yes. And one hears, you know, you can get quite different results depending on which company is in because the data Precisely. is different. Yep. Have they ever experimented just within the same company giving one person's results to more than one interpreter to see even mm -hmm. within the same company can you get different? That is beyond my scope of knowledge and I have a feeling that would be deemed proprietary information by mm -hmm. the testing companies. And they're not going to let that information out for love her money. <laughs> I think the answer is no. I think everybody, yeah, I think everybody is given a certain pile. Here's your pile for the day. Go at it, you know. No, but, um, but if they did, say. If they did, would somebody have different? Well, you know, that depends on what their background is, their educational background, what, how their length of time doing DNA result, okay. results. It could, yes, it could, it could. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Susan.